Good morning. This is our final day wah, of, of this, uh, of our first uh, virtual meeting for the, um, for the air community. Uh, we had a uh, previously a uh, short one, but this is our first big one. So I am totally delighted uh, to uh, present um, our keynote speaker, Inyaki Sands, who is the Georgia Research Alliance uh, eminent scholar in human immunology, uh, director of the uh, Lowen's uh, Center for Human Immunology and uh, director of the Division of Rheumatology um, and professor of medicine and pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine. Um, and Yaki has made uh, incredible contributions to B cell biology and as a, as a clinician um, uh, and in studying uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. And with that, I will um, say thank you, Inyaki, for being here, and we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, uh, for a very kind introduction and to all the organizers for, for the opportunity to present today. Um, and good morning to everybody. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. There you go, and whether I can get them full screen now for the slideshow. And so I hope everybody can see it that way. Um, so, um, you know, what I'm going to try to do today uh, with my time is to give you a sense of where we are in our group trying to discriminate different types of uh, human B cell responses, uh, both in terms of uh, which are the participants, how do we identify them, what do we think they represent, uh, obviously uh, issues about repertoire in the immune responses using these pathways, and then where are their roles or their clinical implications at the end. And I think that's um, in here, um, I will try to also, if there is time and interest, so I put it at the end just in case to allow time for discussion, I will try to give you also some updates on the studies uh, regarding the molecular regulation of abnormal B cell responses in SLE and how we think that they actually inform us now in terms of COVID. So again, in the first part of the, of the presentation, and by the way, I, I have no conflicts of any significance with this talk. Um, I will discuss diversity and characterization of human B cell differentiation pathways and try to at least create some discussion as to how do we uh, or should we try to really call properly memory and effective responses and call them apart uh, when possible. Um, then I will present to you the characteristics of those B cell responses and the repertoire features that we are identifying in severe COVID-19 infection. And then, as I said, if there is time at the end, uh, the molecular regulation of those B cell responses. So, <coughs> excuse me, we have started a number of years ago trying to really uh, identify in humans the components of this part of the conventional B cell responses defined mostly in the mouse. So in other words, if you have a naive B cell that gets activated, we all know that they may form a germinal center and through that germinal center reaction, create a higher affinity and selected by antigen uh, memory B cells as well as plasma cells. Not all of them necessarily, but many of them uh, perhaps uh, being long-lived plasma cells. Then there is, again, in the mouse, <coughs> a well-defined extrafollicular pathway. We will be talking about this more as to whether or not it really is uh, T cell dependent or independent or both, and what type of um, uh, progeny or output the extrafollicular pathway may have. But suffice it to say at this point that that activated B cell uh, can also at the BT cell border without going into the um, follicle or making a, a germinal center reaction necessarily, will activate into some sort of effector um, pathway that gives rise to what is conventionally called a short-term or short-lived plasma blast that may last for you know, two to four weeks perhaps, and then die out. 
And uh, that's sort of the conventional definition or identification in the mouse of the, um, of the exafollicular pathway. So we've been trying for the last few years to identify how this works in humans. And as I said, who are the players and the rules uh, of this in, in, in the human response. And what I'm going to tell you is the story of uh, what we think have identified as the components in humans, starting with an active and naive B cell that becomes an effect of B cell. <clears throat> we call it the N2. And I'll tell you what that represents and why. I'll also tell you now that this probably is called uh, both of them actually sometimes together, unfortunately, uh, given the uh, gating uh, or identification strategies of different groups. Uh, but they are called in many other ways uh, from uh, you know, atypical memory cells to exhausted memory cells to uh, anergic cells, uh, CD21 low cells. They've been called in many different ways, uh, depending on the system used to get to them and also people's preferences, I think. We call it DN2, and I'll tell you why. And then uh, those DN2s, at least in active lupus, seem to be already poised epigenetically to become uh, plasma blasts or plasma cells. There is another type, probably intermediary, that I will not have a lot of time to discuss today, that is DN3, that may represent already an early uh, plasma blast. And we think that these are the components of the extrafollicular pathway in humans. I'll give you an update, maybe more than you want to know, as to multiple papers that continue to come out that I think validate both these as well as the role that this pathway may play in multiple uh, conditions. And so now, hopefully, we are in a situation where we can identify this pathway as well as the conventional germinal center and post-germinal center memory and plasma cell pathway that is being uh, perhaps very characterized over time. And start understanding the role that they may play in different situations or at different time points in the same situation. Be that a vaccine response, an infection, an autoimmune response, or, or whatever may be of interest. So one point that I would make at this time is that, as I mentioned, activated and naive cells and DN2 cells actually are very closely related from every point of view. When you look at their phenotype with the section of uh, exception of IGD expression or not, uh, which I think is unfortunately omitted in many um, uh, publications, uh, these cells are essentially identical in terms of other markers. They are high for C19. By definition, uh, they are positive or negative, uh, I'm sorry, negative, both for active and naive and DN2s for CD27, positive or negative for IgD. And then I will not read everything, you know it, and it's been published multiple times, but they are CXCR5 negative, they are CD11C high, Tibet high, and CD21 negative, and by those criteria, they would, see a, they would be ABC-like, if you like the uh, age, uh, associated B cells, which I think is a misnomer in humans. They overexpress uh, FCRL5, tend not to express FCRL4, and they are also high for PD1 and SLAM F7. Uh, transcriptionally, actually, they are almost identical. If you do RNA sequencing and we publish these, they only differ by 45 DEGs. Uh, the DN2s to the active and naive cells, then you'll see how different they are from anything else. DN1, switch memory, resting naive cells. And similarly, if you take the DN1s, I'll show them to you in a second, they are essentially identical to switch memory cells, only 22 DEGs, whereas there are hundreds of transcriptions, um, um, differences, transcriptional differences from uh, either the active and naive cells or the DN2s. And one of the problems then is that, as I think we already established, and other people as well, that the double negative cells, again, double negatives for IgD as a naive marker and C27 as a conventional memory marker, those cells are often, most of the time actually, uh, isotype switched, and they have significant levels of somatic mutation, albeit they are lower than typical uh, switch memory 
And in some cases, but not others, and I'll show you that for COVID and active lupus, they have uh, uh, less mutation many times than the plasmoblasts in a memory response, okay? So I think that one of the problems that we are facing in the field is that oftentimes without enough um, previous phenotypic discrimination or sorting, uh, people are ascribing a memory property to any transcript or cell expressing a transcript that is either mutated or switched. And I would propose that that's a fundamental problem because I think it's pretty obvious uh, from a lot of different work and more recently things that Carola Binoisa in Australia, Mark Slumshek and many other people have shown that outside and before the germinal center, you have a lot of isotype switch and significant somatic hypermutation. So I would argue again that those features should not be used in isolation to design a memory phenotype for a particular uh, cell. So let me tell you um, how our classification uh, uh, and model came about. So a number of years ago, um, through Chris Tipton's work, what we recognized was that in active uh, lupus patients with acute flares, there was this population within the general naive population, IgD positive, C27 negative cells, where by a number of markers, here we were using mitotracker tracker and C24, but you can use others. There is this highly expanded population within the naive cells that is not present in resting SLE and is not present in healthy controls and that we call active and naive cells. When we did next-gen sequencing of that, as you can see here, there is a significant fraction of those active and naive cells that are clonally expanded and that they are highly connected to the plasma blast and plasma cells that circulate in the blood at the same time. And when we did uh, immunoproteomics uh, of those autoantibodies in the blood, in particular in this case, the 94 fraction, what we saw uh, by matching with the cellular sequence is that a large fraction of the dominant um, species of those antibodies in the blood actually uh, were coming or were matched with the active and naive cell sequences that then transform into antibody secreting cells. And this uh, took us to an observation that we had um, for a number of years, going back to 2007, that when you look at active lupus patients, you see this highly expanded population of cells that are negative for both CD27 and IgD, as I said. And at the time, for lack of a better term, we call them double negatives. More recently, we saw that you have at least two fractions, in, part, in fact, more depending on who you are studying, where if you use CXCR5 and CD11C, but you could essentially substitute CD21 here. I'm sorry, my apologies, I don't know why. Okay, um, if you use, um, you could substitute CD21 here, you could substitute TBET here, for instance and you would get more or less the same fraction. So you identify DN1s that are positive for CXCR5, negative for CD11C and retain CD21, and then DN2s that are negative for CXCR5, have high levels of CD11C and TBET, and uh, loss, um, or have lost uh, CD21. And we showed through that work, that's something uh, that we did, um, uh, Scott Jenks and Kevin Cashman uh, were uh, the first authors in collaboration with Fran Lance Group and there's two Macero there at UAB and then with Jerry Boss as well and Chris Scherer uh, more recently for the molecular regulation of these cells. But altogether we show that these are effective cells uh, produced through the extrafolicular reaction that are epigenetically primed to differentiate into plasmoblasts. This is the recognition of the DN3 cells in other patients where they show prominently uh, here, so, uh, but I, I will not get into that for lack of time. So again, I think that now we have the ability to recognize both the components and mechanisms of the extrafollicular pathway and then the more conventional germinal center memory pathway. And this is a summary. Again, all of this is published, so in the interest of time, I will just, um, sorry, I will just go very briefly over this. Um, this is what we understand right now about this pathway. So you start with a resting naive cell and under the regulation 
of TLR7. Obviously, this is excessive stimulation in lupus for a number of mechanisms. It's most likely the case also in, um, in COVID-19, and we can discuss uh, why we say that. And then uh, uh, guided or sustained by interferon gamma and IL-21, they become activated in naive cells with the phenotypes that I mentioned to you. They are very hypersensitive to TLR7 stimulation, both because they express that pathway, but second, because they lack expression of TRAF5, which for B cells is the main negative regulator of TLR stimulation. And then they become, as I said, very, very similar DN2 cells with the same program, same type of stimulation, and they have lost already IgD. They have acquired a little bit of blimp, and they are on their way to become antibody-secreting cells. I should say that on the account of these features, these cells both are hypersensitive to TLR7, but also to IL-10 and interferon lambda stimulation. And now that was part of the uh, part of the paper and is reflected in this summary here. As I mentioned, this pathway is responsible for a large autoantibody fraction in frame SLE. And in general, they are highly enriched in patients who are African-American. This is going to be another link with severe COVID that have active SLE <coughs> and lupus nephritis and that have altogether very poor disease outcome, which is also true for African-Americans and COVID. Of course, there are different factors in the different situations. So now that we have established what we are calling double negative cells and why, uh, let me show you subsequent papers by multiple groups that seem to be running into these cells and essentially validate, I think, this concept. Also in the tissue. So this is the work of the AMP network in uh, single cell analysis, either of lupus nephritis at the top of the rheumatoid synovium at the bottom. The results are similar in a way. I'm going to concentrate on the lupus nephritis aspect of it. So, so multiple biopsies, they look at all the different cell types and this is just the focus on uh, B cells. And as you can see, they found four big populations. The larger one in the kidneys is what they call CBO or CB0 and that they characterize in the paper as activated uh, B cells. Uh, the DN2 is just my quotation here, just for uh, harmony between the classifications and because they show that that's what they are. So when they did this pseudo time uh, trajectory, uh, they realized they saw that these activated B cells are differentiating from naive B cells. And also they show, I don't think I have it here necessarily, but they compare the transcriptome of these cells to the uh, uh, data sets that we had published with the DN2 and they were essentially uh, superimposable. So we are looking at the same things in the kidney. There were no germinal centers in those, those kidneys, but that was the majority of infiltrating B cells and they derived from naive B cells and were transcriptionally DN tubes. Sort of similar uh, with some differences, but similar concepts in the rheumatoid synovium, again, in the interest of time. I think that um, it's quite clear, again, I'm going to show you more examples of these, that this is what's happening and that these naive cells are differentiating in the tissue into these effector cells. And so I think that the question now becomes more, why are they important or are they important? And why are they competitive with pre-established autoimmune memory cells? Because these are chronic autoimmune diseases where you know that there is preformed high affinity autoimmune memory. And yet what we continue to see again and again uh, where people are looking is that there are new naive cells coming into the system uh, that seem to be quite important or at least quite prominent. And that's something that we had initially reported in our study. And I think that there is a number of reasons why that could be the case. Um, one is sheer numbers of autoreactive B cells in the naive repertoire. Up to 30% of them have some degree of autoreactivity, even in normal people. And when you look just at total numbers, since the memory cells are the more prevalent ones, then probably in terms of total numbers and precursors, of autoreactive cells is higher in the naive, in the naive compartment. Uh, they are obviously adept to making germinal centers. I'm not saying that these cells could not end up, at least some of them contributing to germinal centers. 
and they may generate extra follicularly. And again, I think that this may be another misconception that they do not, but they may generate long-lived memory and plasma cells. And I'm happy to discuss that evidence uh, if somebody has, has questions. And then we will uh, go back later at the end of the talk as to whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, they are subject to censoring in an, effective, in an effective way. So these are papers from multiple groups in the last couple of years that seem to be running into the same cells again and again. This is the work that Jack Bancho and um, Virginia Pesquale uh, did recently and published in Nature Immunology uh, as a resource uh, paper. They did massive sequencing of single cells, uh, total PBMCs out of, I think, 60 or so uh, pediatric lupus patients, well characterized clinically. And uh, these are, again, the B-cell compartment. And what you can see in these UMAPs is that there is this orange population, this five um, uh, population, number five, that is essentially only present in significant numbers in childhood lupus, but not in healthy controls. When you look at them, they uh, are part of this cluster that concentrates most of the active patients or most patients in the cluster are active. And also when they look once again at their transcriptome here, and in this case, I call them both ABC or DN2s, but once again, uh, it reproduces one by one all the transcriptional and phenotypic signature of the BN2 cells. This is a study that Judy James did in Oklahoma where they look at uh, lupus patients with John Merrill and essentially when they had a non-threatening uh, organ threatening flare, they treated them with a single dose of steroids. Then they stopped that and watched for either early or late flares. Long story short, the main um, um, correlate of uh, upcoming early flare was the appearance of CDC, uh, CD86 high naive B cells. So again, activated naive cells coming into the picture before the lupus flare. This is a very provocative paper also <clears throat> by a different group, uh, Dana Orange uh, at um, Brigham, I believe, uh, where uh, a few months ago in the New England Journal, and essentially here what they did was to monitor weekly uh, by a, a finger um, a prick, uh, a blood drop, uh, uh, rheumatoid patients that were stable until they uh, um, underwent a flare, disease flare. And then they did the transcriptomic analysis of the whole blood at all those time points preceding the flare. And as you can see here, what happened is that the, just the week before the flare, they had a signature of expansion of this circulating pre-inflammatory mesenchymal or prime cells. But one week before that happened, they had the uh, emergence of a signature of B cells. And those B cells were again, predominantly naive B cells. And their speculation is that, in fact, these cells probably are activating the prime mesenchymal cells, and then somehow uh, they would go to the synovium and induce disease. And this is just simply yet another paper. There are many, um, I think it started mostly by what Mark Lamsek did uh, years ago in the LPR mice, but showing that in different models, actually, the activation of autoreactive uh, naive cells in the extra or through the extra follicular pathway may contribute to significant autoimmunity and SLE-like disease. This is from uh, Boris Rice's uh, more recently. So it takes back again to uh, how we are calling those cells, uh, because I'm telling you here on the one hand that uh, we believe that in many circumstances, these are activated naive cells going through an effective pathway uh, to give you a very productive and potentially dangerous um, um, plasma plus or um, plasma cell response. And yet cells with very similar phenotype are being called atypical memory B cells uh, in different situations, whether HIV or malaria or some other situations, right? This is a paper uh, more recently in HIV, showing that the majority of activated B cells in chronic biremic patients in lymph node biopsies are actually the same extra follicular pathways, but they are called dysfunctional or they are called exhausted. 
And so there is clearly a discrepancy there. And you could argue either that we are recognizing different things with the same phenotype or that the same things may represent uh, different uh, functions in different situations. That's quite possible. I think that there are studies that really look at memory responses. And when you look at memory responses, you can certainly find a subset with high CD11C and high TBET. And you could say, well, this is a memory cell. And it may be an effect of memory cell in that context. The, con the, the, the question being, are they different than in other situations? And are they dysfunctional and exhausted or they are simply activated, right? I think that that's something that the field has to deal with and hopefully resolve. Uh, resolve. I can say that there is being, I think, developments of significance in the malaria field. Uh, Sue Pierce has published a very interesting paper showing that in those supposed atypical memory cells, which I would argue that they are not atypical, they are just part of a normal immune response. And in many cases, they are non memory. So I think that that classification really is not very helpful. But what she shows anyway, whatever they may be, is that if you look at them with sophisticated methods, where you look at cross-linking of the B cell receptor by membrane bound antigens, and those cells respond perfectly well. They just don't respond so well to soluble antigen. And that's for a number of different reasons that again, I'm happy to discuss. One of them is that they express lower, uh, lower levels of surface receptor. Now, uh, and then Sue actually went further. And I think that appropriately uh, discussed in a review that exhaustion may not be in the human B cell vocabulary and at least not in malaria based on this data. I think that there is another review by uh, another group, also in immunological reviews dealing with the, same, with the same issue. So this is just to tell you that if you look at cells, certainly in lupus in an open-ended fashion, you don't decide, you don't look at say a flu memory response or chronic viremia or anything like that, but you may be favoring more memory responses. But in lupus, where you have the luxury, in a way, of looking at concurrent, naive activation, as well as ongoing memory responses, as you might expect. And then you look at the expression of CD11C and either CXVR5, or as I said, CD21, or TBET. What you can see here in the context of TBET, for instance, is that it is actually the activated naive cells and the DN2s opposed or as opposed to the N1s or to resting naive or even to memory that express the higher levels side by side of TBET and CD11C. This is reflected here and this is this fraction of the activated memory cells that also express TBET and CD11C but they are intermediate. So again in a fair situation where you have both systems underway and activated the highest expressors of TBET and CD11C are the active and naive cells and the DN2. Although, again, you can find that fraction in memory. It represents something else. And if you are focusing on memory responses, that's what you are going to conclude. This is sort of the same in a different way. And so, yes, in the interest of time, let me move on. Um, I'll just say this about a um, couple of things about the molecular regulation of these cells. It's been published already. And then I move on to the uh, COVID data uh, and beyond if we can, maybe not. But one of the features of uh, resting naive cells in lupus, these are when you are not looking at what we have defined as active naive cells or DN2s, this is what you could best call resting naive cells because of their surface phenotype, right? Uh, so again, they don't have CD11C, TBET, they don't have CD86, they don't have any uh, activation markers. Uh, but when you look at them molecularly, whether it's by ataxic or by RNA sequencing or by methylation analysis, and you have here in dark the resting knife cells of lupus and in light green in healthy controls, you see that there are marked differences with all three uh, assays. Uh, so they are very different already molecularly, even if phenotypically they are the same. And there are abnormalities already in the resting naive cell here, sorry, um, include many things. I'm just simply here highlighting uh, the activation of the uh, 
of the B-cell receptor through NER77 expression as a surrogate or of TLR pathways of, of other interferon, in this case, induced genes. And also STAT4 that, as you know, is a major uh, disease allele for SLE. And this is the, as a summary, again, of multiple papers that we've published in the, in the last few years, looking at the hierarchy, if you will, of transcription factors that are controlling this pathway in SLE and the ones that cap, come at the top for DN2s. Same thing for active and naive cells. You can see that here for TBET and AP1, or TBET, AP1, the oh. early uh, growth uh, genes, EGRs, and a number of them. Um, and then you, on the other hand, can see the ones that are shared between naive and memory cells, and then the ones uh, including NF kappa B and OCT2 that seem to be um, um, at the top um, for uh, switch memory cells. Um, this is just simply a tactic for TBET, uh, showing how uh, their uh, epigenetic regulation or increased accessibility uh, is pronounced in active cells and DN2 over the other cell types, and whether that um, actually may be more pronounced um, or is more pronounced there than in the other, in the other um, cell types, B cell types. So just to summarize this part of the talk, or at least the credits of what I have been saying, this work has been done by multiple people in our lab. Uh, Chen Wen uh, did a lot of the lethal phenotyping, Chris and Jen, a lot of the sequencing, uh, some of which I'll probably show later. Scott, together with Kevin, did a lot of the uh, molecular analysis. Anchor is doing a lot of single cell analysis that I may not be able to show you at the end. And Matt has contributed a lot of, uh, to the sequencing recently, but he's been the lead person in the, in the COVID work as well. Multiple collaborators in the uh, rheumatology group at Emory, Sam Lim, and Irish Ukosograhi as well in the, in the lupus cohorts. Onion Lee uh, in the uh, plasma cell work and invaluable collaborators at uh, UAB, Fran Land, Troy Randall, and Steph Sumacero. A lot of the um, uh, pipelines for single cell analysis come from Greg Gibson and his studies as students at Georgia Tech, uh, Mishu, Maggie, and Erin. And then uh, again, the uh, epigenetic work was done in collaboration with Jerry Boss and Chris Sher and all the people in their labs. And, funding through a number of uh, institutes, including the Autoimmunity Centers of Excellence of NIID, a new uh, funding through uh, the U54 network for COVID through the NCI and our local uh, institutions. So um, I may have hopefully maybe 10 minutes. I'll have to stop there, I guess, with the second part. But let's get into the, uh, the COVID situation. So we started, uh, when the pandemic hit, we started looking at severe uh, COVID patients as well as non-severe uh, outpatient COVID A or COVID B uh, for their B cell phenotypes. And what we show was that if you look at these severe lupus, uh, lupus COVID patients that are in the ICU, they are on uh, mechanical ventilation. Unfortunately, uh, most of them passed away, so they didn't do well. And uh, the vast majority of them were African-American patients. So what you can see just by B-cell phenotypic profiling by multicolor flow cytometry is that there is really clustering of patients on that basis. And you can see here this prominent response of the severe group that is dominated by this extra follicular response, the A, uh, active and naive, the DN2s. The DN3s also show there prominently, and then plasmoblasts and plasma cells. And these patients have, I should say, very high titers of neutralizing antibodies. Nevertheless, they still do quite poorly. Now, if you look at the double negative distribution, you can see here in the severe group that as uh, similar to uh, SLE, the dominance of DN1s, that is uh, uh, characteristic of uh, resting normal uh, subjects, and was also found in the less severe COVID group, is completely reversed. So that now DN2s are taking over uh, also in lupus, sometimes in some patients, DN3s are also very prominent. And all of that is just shown in here in different ways, but the message is es essentially the same. Uh, well, let me just, well, 
Let me go back to this one. So more recently, what we have seen is that if you look at the severe group here shown in a different way, and it's a different subset of patients, they have a very high frequency of broad autoreactivity, whether it's rheumatoid factor, which only was found uh, in the um, less severe population, I'm sorry, in the severe population, or uh, ANAs or a combination of both. So up to 70% of severe patients have those autoantibodies, a much lower fraction with lower titer and no rheumatoid factor is found in the less severe population. And then what we also found is that that severe ICU population is highly enriched as in lupus uh, for 94 autoantibodies, which we also saw in the previous cohort. Actually, this is from the previous cohort. And all of this fits very well with the idea, once again, of the extra follicular response. And just in parallel, Shipilai and the group at uh, MGH published this very interesting paper in Cell, where they took severe patients that passed from the disease and they had access to uh, lymphoid tissue. And what they show essentially is that the germinal centers in those patients were highly disrupted. They thought that it was because of increased production of TNFs through macrophages. But one way or the other, the germinal center was uh, disrupted. There was no good interaction with follicular T helper cells. And what they had was a major production or expansion of these extra follicular B cells, double negatives, as they characterize them. So our model from that point of view is that um, uh, what we are seeing is this intense extra follicular reaction. I think that it may happen through TLR ligands that obviously would be quite important also uh, in the context of COVID being a single stranded RNA um, uh, virus, but also for other reasons. There is a number of candidates for extra follicular, follicular T helper cells or TFHs, whether the TH10s of the T peripheral helper cells from different groups. Uh, and then uh, I think that what we are seeing is a primary repertoire that, as I mentioned in the beginning, has a very high concentration of primary autoreactivity. We would propose that there may not be checkpoints in the extra follicular reaction. And in a way, this is like an open pathway, not toll or toll free, uh, ironically, uh, giving rise or to an expansion almost uncensored of whatever may be in the primary com compartment. And as I said, uh, through the work of different people, we know not only that this can happen and does happen extra follicularly, but actually it can generate also long lived memory and plasma cells. So you may have really chronic consequences. All right, so finally, at least if I can say uh, a few minutes of repertoire. This, we published this in the original paper. What we saw is that the ASCs in the severe COVID-19 have a representation of IgM, IgG, and IgA. So there is a lot of switching even early on. Uh, if you look at the ASCs here, you can see that a lot of the clonal expansions in the IgM population are switching proactively within a few days and you find mixed clones with the different isotypes. You find, as you can see here in different patients, whether by single cell or bulk uh, sequencing, that there are very substantial clonal expansions in many of them. And then you can see that in the different isotypes, actually there is a lot, you look at IgM, but also IgG1 and IgA1, there's a lot of unmutated uh, clones there. Uh, although you also see a significant accumulation of somatic hypermutation already. And these are just some lineage trees that make the point essentially that you can start and do a start in many cases with an identifiable germline IgM node. And then you see the diversification, both in terms of different isotype switches, as well as significant accumulation of somatic hypermutation. All of these within the same clone within a few days of the beginning of the infection. And we are speculating for now that perhaps these different branches of the tree might be selected in different ways and might contribute to explain uh, why you are having antiviral neutralizing antibodies, but also autoimmune reactions. And this is just the data for the serum BH434 there. I should say that this is something that we had published before in lupus patients where we show actually that you look at the circulating plasma cells at the time of a flare in the uh, switch compartment, you see a huge percentage, up to 60% of them 
where there is very, very little somatic hypermutation in those circulating ASCs. And I think that they are reflected in both cases, the big contribution of that newly formed, naive derived extra follicular reaction. Uh, these are the um, uh, molecular data for sequencing. And essentially uh, what you can see is that the ASCs in severe COVID-19 are highly enriched for IgM and IgG1. Not that, uh, um, and you can see here in the summary of all of them relative to just yes, naive cells, these are healthy donors at a steady state, which as you can see, and Tom Dorner has published this before, is dominated by IgA, but then in the severe COVID responses, you can see how now, you know, IgG1 uh, is highly, uh, I'm sorry, that's here, IgG1s are highly uh, expanded. Um, many patients still have a lot of IgA and some patients also IgM. So there is an expansion of all of it, but they clearly are enriched for IgM and IgG1 relative to uh, steady state patients. They have both IgM and IgG, very low mutation rate in the severe patients, and that is sort of shown in here. Um, and then uh, IgG1 as well, they express very low mutation rate, and you see the differences here compared to other other subclasses. Uh, the trend is there for everything, although it may not be significant, for instance, for IgG2 or even for IgG3. But there is also a trend for less uh, in, in IgG1. This is BH utilization. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because essentially we didn't see anything that was dramatic or that was consistent. This, I should say, is all single cell analysis of several uh, thousands of cells per patient. And there is a big spread in many cases. There is diversity as you might expect. So I don't think that we can draw a strong conclusion at this point. Here we use a Steve Kleinstein's uh, baseline method and he might be able to comment on this better. But what we saw is that the IgG1 and the IgM, we were looking here in particular uh, with an eye on BH434, but this is the analysis of everything. And what we saw is that actually the selection in principle of IG mutations in IgG1 and IgM uh, was much less selected than in the other isotypes. And the problem here, of course, is that most of the patients we analyzed had very, very low rate of mutation. So I'm not sure how, work, uh, how well the system may work there. And maybe Steve can comment on that. BH434 was overexpressed, mostly in IgG1. And the other thing that was interesting is that if you look at the concept of redemption, meaning the ABY uh, patch in framework one encoded in the germline and responsible for intrinsic autoreactivity. Although due to this outlier, there was no significance, but it's much less mutated once again uh, in the patients with COVID-19, suggesting that there is no counter selection of that type of photoreactivity in these patients. Inyaki, you've got yep. uh, three minutes left, just to, just to let you know. All right, so then I'll, I'll finish here very quickly. So this is just to show that the IgM and IgG1 compartments that I show you were enriched for 434. Uh, I think I did, and if not, I'm telling you now, uh, lower levels of mutations and expanded in these severe patients. They are clonally interconnected, which is shown here with this symptom index uh, of connectivity. And uh, this is essentially the IgM connections to other isotypes, and you see that while in healthy donors a steady state is with the IgAs here is highly enriched for the uh, IgG1. And that is sort of shown in here in other ways, that depending on the level of mutation of the different uh, components. And this is just to show you something I think very interesting that also validates what I'm telling you as we show in active lupus, which is that if you look at the naive compartment and you look at the top clonal ex expansions here, organized by size, you see the level of connectivity with ASCs and also with expanded ASC clones showing a very active process of differentiation there. Uh, and that includes also IgG1s that we start seeing to emerge within that naive compartment, presumably the activated naive cells are starting to switch and how they are prominent and how they are connected heavily to the ASCs. So in the interest of time, because this is just to reiterate the conclusions I may just simply stop. Um, obviously, I don't have time for that, this part, but all this is published 
and um, I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Wow, Inyaki, that was an amazing review of the literature and uh, also follow up on um, the uh, great talk that you gave to us back in 2017. I don't know if you recall visiting um, the same group, but uh, where you were showing um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, DN2 cells uh, in, in SLE, and now you're tying it together with, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, so we have a few minutes available for questions uh, from the audience. And uh, okay, so we have one question right now. Do you know if there is any relation between the prevalence of autoreactive antibodies and the age of the patients? That's a great question. No, because um, you know the, the, the patients that we see in the ICU, at least at the time, um, were mostly, um, well, I wouldn't say necessarily elderly. I mean, the range may have gone from, you know, maybe 35 to 40 all the way to uh, 70s, but certainly were, you know, um, not uh, children or it did not represent the entire spectrum of ages. So from that point of view, no, uh, we are doing a lot of studies now uh, with MISC and also with childhood um, COVID, and we certainly see autoantibodies, but I'm not sure that we can really make a correlation or a discrimination at this point. Okay, let me just check. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm looking for raised hands and all that. I'm just not used to this format. Okay, so yeah, I would like to ask you, uh, kind of um, leading up, um, uh, adding on to that is, so where you see this buildup of um, DN2 like cells with age, you know, with, um, you know, some people are talking about this age association or exhaustion or whatever buildup. Uh, do you um, think that that uh, in, uh, increased um, uh, in, in that, in that B cell subset is, um, has got to do with um, activation of naive memory cells, um, such as what you're seeing in SLE or in an acute viral infection? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, um, I am understanding that the question is maybe twofold. One is really associated with age, and the other one is whether, you know, in elderly patients or subjects, they represent the same either naive or memory activation. I guess that that's, um, it's, it's hard to answer. I mean, what, what, what I can tell you is that certainly in humans, you know, whether if you study healthy, which is very hard to define elderly patients, uh, do you find a little bit more of um, these double negatives ABCs? A, uh, we haven't done it ourselves. The papers that I have looked at uh, the markers were different, and it's hard to answer the question, but, you know, uh, I don't think that there are dramatic differences. What I can tell you certainly is that the autoimmune diseases, and we have, and I think was part of our initial paper, uh, um, children with lupus as, as young as four or five years of age. And actually, uh, in those patients that we did, a few only, the vast majority of cells in the blood altogether were DN2s. So certainly from that point of view, I think that this uh, um, universal response, regardless of age. Now, whether, it, again, in, in, in healthy, so to speak, again, if there is no comorbidities uh, subjects, say over 70, do you see a natural increase of them? Again, I haven't seen studies using the same markers and what do they represent there? I think that it could be both. And I don't think that the studies have shown this, right? But I think that, I mean, essentially, and maybe I failed to make that point, but what we have seen in vitro and ex vivo is that if you take almost any type of B cell, whether it's naive, whether 
is a, a, a resting memory, whether it's a DM1, and you activate them under many conditions, mostly sort of TH1-like conditions, you get this phenotype. You, uh, um, um, you know, downregulate CD21, yeah, you uh, increase CD11C, TBET. So I think that this is a very general response of activation. And maybe the question is, in a way, is the fate of the progeny of a TBET positive B cell then different down the stream, right? Uh, but I think that in terms of generating these, I don't think there is a particular lineage. And I think that it depends on the situation and what is it that you are looking at. I see. Well, um, yeah, because uh, I just I just noticed in a in a review by uh, Michael Cancro where he specifically mentions this this cell population that you're describing as potentially being uh, the same as what he's describing, and so that, that that's why I, I brought that up. Yeah, I think that um, Mike, Mike's work, which actually I, I think is is very good and very important. Um, but I think that in his models, uh, clearly a, the memory is, is um, somehow favored because of the experimental systems uh, in which the, um, uh, they are looking, uh, right? Whether it's in the mouse or whether there was, I think, in that paper, some very interesting uh, studies with the uh, thoracic duct as to migration and residence uh, in the tissue and also uh, in different responses, right? Um, with some of that in humans. But I think that a lot of the experimental models, they are favor the study of memory. And there is no doubt, once again, that you then have some activated memory responses that have also these markers. Okay, and uh, here's a last question. Uh, is it known whether severe COVID-19 patients with extra follicular reactions do generate long-lived memory B cells to SARS-CoV-2? So this is asking, and I'm very interested in this too, uh, the development of long-lived memory out of this population. So that's a critical question. And I think that the answer will be there in, as soon as we get enough time to follow up these patients to a point where we feel comfortable that the persistence of these clones in, a, in, a, in general, right? If they persist, say, months after the virus is gone, whatever the phenotype of the cell is, one way or the other, this is a memory response, right? And that's what is lacking, I think, in many studies, right? That the memory phenotype is assumed rather than confirmed. Um, beforehand. So uh, that is going to take some time, but that's one of the main goals that we are pursuing. What I can tell you is of a very interesting study that I didn't show, uh, published in February in the uh, proceedings in the PNAS, where they look at uh, yellow fever primary responses by um, antigen-specific loss cytometry. And, you know, it's, it's really very nice according to our model as well. You know, within a week or two, you see a major fraction of activated naive cells that are antigen specific. And when they look at one year after the vaccine, uh, and that should be a memory response, obviously, uh, then uh, what they see is that the vast majority, well, vast majority, a majority, a plurality of cells, maybe 50 to 60% or more in some of the subjects, there were only two, um, were actually double negatives. And they didn't call it that way, but it would be the phenotype that I think is a DM1, which we think is more on the memory side of things. And so, uh, but for whatever it's worth, a year after the vaccination, the, uh, more than 50% of the antigen-specific cells were not in the conventional CD27 positive switch memory compartment, but instead in a CD27 negative isotype switch uh, compartment, which, you know, by our classification would be a DM1. So clearly those reactions, yeah, I think that those reactions clearly have the potential to form memory and we need to study that better and then define is that memory of different quality? Uh, did they generate different type of plasma cells? One is reactivated uh, and that's what I meant by the fate of, uh, of, these, uh, of these responses, right? But uh, I think that we are going to find that yes, that they can form memory. Great. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation and